and welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Anais and I make videos related to Kubernetes and the cloud native ecosystem. As the title of this video reveals, this video is about eBPF. Now, in previous videos, I haven't spoken, I haven't talked about eBPF yet. And this video is really to get started on that topic, to provide a light rate, but hopefully complete introduction to eBPF. We are going to cover first some fundamentals, some fundamental concept around Linux based operating system as well as Linux. And then we're going to dive into eBPF, what it is, how does it work at high level and how do you get started? Remember that most of my videos contain a written version of all of the content covered. Similarly, in this video, you can find the blog post link below in the description for everything that I'm going to talk about. Let's get started. So if you're watching my videos before, you've probably heard about Linux, Linux based operating systems. I myself, for example, use um, microcades and Ubuntu on my Raspberry Pis and they are from Canonical. Um, now, Linux is one of the most popular operating systems or um, Linux based distributions that are used on the edge in data centers, also on your phone, Android, which is one of the most used operating system is based on Linux as well. Now, the thing is we have to understand some components of Linux based operating system to understand how eBPF actually works. So the thing is, we can divide most operating systems into user space and kernel space. Now the operating system is responsible to manage the communication between the software and the hardware on your operating system. And the software can be divided within user space. So that's anything that a user can actually access, such as the files and applications on your machine. And then the kernel space. And the kernel space really encompasses all of the vital functions that are needed to make the computer work, such as memory management, anything related to security, um, any device drivers that are needed to communicate between your applications um, and what your machine, what your computer is actually supposed to do. Now, while some, while most people usually don't interact with the kernel space, there are some situations in which we actually want to interact with the kernel space because ultimately, before information go from the kernel space to the user space, like anything basically um, that is forwarded, um, it's going to be filtered to some extent, right? So, for example, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, right, um, and some processes happen on a node level. We might learn about them through the logs in our um, pods, but until they get there, they're actually already going to be filtered um, based on like basically, for example, what the application is going to log on and, and other things, right? <laughs> so usually we won't get the direct, the pure information from the kernel space. Um, instead, we will get a partial or filtered version within a user space. And for most, also for most engineers, for most developers um, who are interacting with higher level languages, such as web based languages uh, and, and similar and application based languages, um, they're going to be fine with that abstraction. But if we actually want to get, for example, detailed information on the security, on the networking of all of these processes that are happening within the kernel space, that's when we need something else. So in some cases, however, we need the raw information from the kernel space, right? The unfiltered information. And to get the unfiltered information out, you have to load additional functionality into the kernel. And that could either be done theoretically by proposing updates to the kernel. However, that takes a long time and that the update is going to be accepted. That's, that's very questionable. It could take years until it's actually in a space across your kernel where you can actually use that adult functionality. So another option would be to load kernel modules into the kernel and to add the functionality that you require. The thing is with kernel modules, while you don't have to recompile the kernel to make the kernel module work, um, what happens is that there are so many different kernel versions that with every version of the kernel, uh, you will need to modify the kernel module. With every update to the kernel, your kernel module will likely break. So as you can tell, it's very difficult to interact with the functionality um, within, in, in like the processes that are happening within the kernel. So that's exactly where eBPF comes in and provides a more efficient 
secure um, and easy way to interact with the kernel. EBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Package Filter. However, it has very little to do with the project that the acronym originated from. So you can really just say EBPF is EBPF. Or at least that's what a lot of people in the space kind of preach. Um, now, EBPF allows you to load bytecode into the kernel in a sandbox environment. A sandbox environment is a very constrained environment where not many things can go wrong. And basically through loading bytecode programs um, directly into the kernel, you can get information, the raw information on like security, on application processes, on networking out of the kernel space um, before they get processed and filtered and then presented in different formats in the user space, um, if at all, right? Um, there's a lot of information going on in the kernel space on the processes that you will not necessarily directly have access to in the user space. Um, and eBPF can expose those information. I just want to give a quick shout out to Jose, who is part of the Aqua Security Open Source team, who helped me proofread my blog post and thus helped me to create this video, as well as Shobam, who is one of our contributors to Trivi, and he also contributed to Tracy in the past. EBPF programs have some constraints in the way they work, and I'm not going to go into the details on the different components of EBPF programs, but basically the main one is that if we have the user space here, and we have in the user space, the eBPF program, right? Here's the eBPF program. Then that is gonna be loaded into the kernel space. Again, cold fingers. And here we have a verifier. That's going to check whether or not that program is actually um, written in accordance to some rules. So it's basically going to be loaded into the verifier first in the kernel space and it's checked that there are, for example, no loops within the program because um, programs within the kernel can't contain, for example, if loops that you have in many high level programming languages. So if it contains any of those, any like anything that is prohibited, it will be rejected. If it's, however, valid eBPF code, hope you say it like that. Then it's going to be loaded from the verification into execution. And it's going to be executed in the kernel space. And then once the output has been generated, it's going to be loaded. The output is going to be loaded into the user space and you present it with the output. So now, why am I speaking about eBPF? since I have very limited understanding of how it all works. And this blog post, again, um, the blog post link below has more details. The thing is that eBPF got very popular over the past years in the cloud native space, cloud native Kubernetes clusters, right? Cloud native workloads, container based workloads are very complex processes um, that are very difficult to monitor, to assess, um, to improve. And eBPF and different eBPF programs um, make that easier. So, for instance, a lot of times, like mentioned, we only see the filtered outcome of processes, like the result of them, but we can't observe them and like what they, the processes that's what's actually happening on the node level. And that's something that makes enables eBPF to do. Um, for us to do, basically enables us to do that. <laughs> um, so we can use eBPF, for example, for security purposes, um, as well as for networking. Those are two of the main use cases, um, as well as observability. Um, I mean, observability and security is, is very closely linked, in my opinion. But um, yeah, so Aqua and the Aqua open source team has one of the main projects is Tracy and Tracy is a security runtime and forensic tool using eBPF. And we have some very nice starter guides that you can check out um, to actually try out how eBPF works. And um, my next video on the Aqua open source channel, one of my next videos is going to be focused on getting started with Tracy. You can find here different starter guides, either to use it with Docker or with Kubernetes. As always, I really hope this video was useful. All of the content, everything discussed in this video is linked below in the description. 
I really hope you enjoyed this kind of content. If you did, it would mean a lot to me if you could give this video a thumbs up to make sure that other people see my content as well and subscribe to my channel for upcoming videos. I would really hope to see one of my next videos. Have an amazing day. Bye bye.